Organizers and political leaders have been working on getting Americans out to vote for decades now, pouring their energy into drawing out the young voter, the suburban voter, the first-time voter, the elderly, and to a degree it's worked. But despite that effort, there are still large blocks of Americans, eligible Americans, who don't vote and are often not encouraged to do so. Poor and low-income Americans are quite often uh, a neglected and ignored voter bloc, but with over 140 Americans in poverty, they're a group that could hold immense power. According to a study by the Poor People's Campaign in 2016, if poor and low-income voters would have turned out at the same rate as higher-income voters, the results in 15 states could have flipped. Because while 29 million low-income voters did cast ballots, another 34 million eligible low-income voters did not. That makes their turnout rate 20 percent lower than higher-income voters. That's 15 states that could have flipped. Now, as we head into the 2020 election, it's critical that amid a recession, amid racial strife and consistent defunding of our social safety net programs, poor people get a voice. My next guest has been at the forefront of the work to build up that coalition. He's got a plan to make it happen. I'm joined by the Reverend Dr. William Barber. He's the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, the president of Repairers of the Breach and co-author of Revive Us Again, Vision and Action on, uh, in Moral Organizing. Uh, Reverend Dr. Barber, good to see you again. I get, here's the thing. When we talk about the voiceless, the least among us, uh, we're actually talking about uh, poor people in America. The reason they're not targeted to vote is because they're not subject to anybody's advertising. They don't. Uh, nobody looks for them. They don't have sway. They don't make donations. Uh, and and to the point we just made, they've not got a history of voting. So they tend to be fully ignored. How do we change that systemically so that they're actually part of the conversation? Well, Ali, a lot of times the reason people have not voted, number one, is the voter suppression that goes on, particularly among poor people, poor African American, poor Latinos, and then it impacts poor white people as well. But also, as we've crisscrossed the country, a lot of poor and low wealth people never hear their issue. Uh, they never hear the things that they're concerned about really talking to them and lifting them up. Well, they're starting to say across this country, that's going to be no longer. The, the rallying cry now is we must do more. We must shift this narrative. We must be a power. And, and we saw it happen in Kentucky. Some of it's happened in New Mexico. I've seen it happen in North Carolina. The, the Senate, uh, Alshie, for instance, is in play. And poor people and low-income people have the power to make the play. You mentioned those 15 states. It would take less than 20 percent. In some of those states, it's 1 percent. All of them are battle state, battleground state. One percent change in poor and low-income voting in Michigan could flip it. Nineteen percent change in North Carolina. Something like six percent change in Georgia. And so what poor and low-wealth people are saying, we're no longer going to wait on people to speak our issues. We have an agenda for the healing of the nation. We're going to vote in mass. We're going to change this narrative, and, and we're going to be a force to re- be reckoned with. And this report shows the kind of force it, they can be, and that it's really political malpractice and political suicide not to reach out to, listen to this, Alshit, 25 percent of the voting population, 25 percent of the electorate are poor and low wealth. Over 140 million people are poor and low wealth before COVID, going over 175 million in COVID. It is not only immoral, it is impractical. It makes no political sense to leave poor and low wealth people off the table. You, you, one of the things that you want to do is change the way the Democratic Party gets poor people registered to vote. What does that involve? Well, one of the things we're doing is we're having a massive campaign that's entitled MORE, mobilizing, organizing, registering, educating people for the movement who vote. And even beyond partisans, we're nonpartisan. What we're saying is we must mobilize people around issues. Dr. King told us in 65, at the end of the Selma to Montgomery March, that, that every time there's a lot of division and blocking and suppression of vote, it's the fear of extremists, the fear of the, of the, of, of the aristocracy, of poor and low wealth, white and black people coming together and change. He saw that in 65. Surely we can see it in 2020. So we're saying to the, the Democratic Party, make sure there's a prominent place. You cannot ignore it. I personally, we personally in the movement think it's a problem to open your convention, for instance, with John Casey, who has had a history of doing policies against the poor welfare reform, uh, pushing voter suppression, open it with poor and low wealth people of every race, creed, and color. Let them tell their story. Make sure they're at the table, because that's what this is really about. That's what really has to happen in this moment. And the question for the Democratic Party or any party is, can you resist the labels of left versus right and focus on our moral center and economic justice? Because there's this whole group of people, 25 percent of the electorate, 
are saying that no longer will we be quiet anymore. Reverend Dr. William Barber, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, thank you for joining me, sir, on the work that you're doing to get poor people uh, into, the full, uh, into the political system as full participants. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.